Hi there, it's me again, Christine, giving all of you a warm welcome to a brand new episode here at Let's Talk Audit and Assurance. And for now, we're finally going to open the playlist for the Independent Auditor's Report. Why don't we all take a moment to savor the fact that we are very much near the end of the audit process, my friends. As today, we're finally going to talk about the very output of the auditor, and that is, of course, the Independent Auditor's Report. So if you haven't done so yet, and if you'd like a episode so far please do not forget to hit the like button and give us a subscribe here at let's talk audit and assurance so when we start talking about the report of the independent auditor we have to go back to the very beginning as usual and this very beginning would be all about what are the overall objectives of an auditor in the performance of an fs audit well our objectives are simply twofold Number one, that is to express an opinion. And number two, that will be to report on the financial statements as required by our PSAs. Therefore, when we talk about the objectives of an audit, we think about the opinion and we think about the audit report. Now, speaking of the opinion, we always say that the opinion will be about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements in accordance with an acceptable financial reporting framework. So, as early as now, let's try to differentiate the two types of financial reporting frameworks that we have. The first one is what we call the fair presentation framework, and the second one is a compliance framework. Now, maybe you could guess as early as now what's the main difference between the two, but when we talk about the compliance framework, the idea is simply to comply. Nothing more, nothing less. Whatever the framework asks, the client provides. But when we talk about the fair presentation framework, of course, it will always have to start with the compliance aspect. That's the bare minimum. But in a fair presentation framework, the client may provide more than what the standards are asking, and they may also provide less, or they may be allowed to deviate in rare instances where following the standards would cause the financial statements to be materially misstated. Having said that, when we talk about the fair presentation framework, we have to remember in instances where the client decides to provide disclosures beyond those specifically required by the framework, then the client must acknowledge explicitly or implicitly that this was done in order to achieve fair presentation. On the rare instances where management or our client needs to depart from the requirement of a framework to achieve fair presentation, ladies and gentlemen, the client must explicitly acknowledge it. So when you come to think about it, if the client provides more, the client may either implicitly or explicitly acknowledge that providing more is what is needed in order to achieve fair presentation. But should the client provide less or should the client deviate from what the standards are requiring, the client must explicitly acknowledge that doing so is the only way to achieve fair presentation. In instances whereby the client deviates from what the framework requires, then the management must explicitly explicitly state that, number one, the financial statements are still fairly presented. Management must also identify which particular standard which they did not follow the justification of why they didn't follow the said standard, and what alternative treatment they have used. Other than that, they must also explicitly state what is the effect of this deviation on the financial statements. And again, another explicit statement that says all other standards have been followed. Right? However, in a compliance framework, as what we have said, simply compliance <laughs> just whatever is asked then that was that is what is provided of course if you come to think of it and reflect on it in the philippines our pfrs makes use of the fair presentation framework let's try to apply some of these concepts to statements okay like if, as per usual we get to identify whether these statements are true or false for example in statement one there are three general purpose financial reporting frameworks fair presentation compliance framework and a special purpose framework this is of course false as there are only two identified frameworks fair presentation and compliance framework statement number two the fair presentation framework acknowledges explicitly or implicitly that to achieve fair presentation it may be necessary for management to provide disclosures beyond those specifically required by the framework so providing beyond may be acknowledged either explicitly or implicitly so to statement two we say 
you are true. Statement 3. The compliance framework acknowledges explicitly that it may be necessary for management to depart from the requirement of the framework to achieve fair presentation of the financial statements. And this is, of course, false. Because in this case, when you talk about the compliance framework, well, management just provides exactly what is asked. Not beyond, not less. So that is what makes statement 3 false as it invokes the compliance framework. Right? Let's take a look at this particular definition and see if we could, like, you know, identify what framework is being referred to here. In very rare circumstances, an entity may need to produce financial reports which do not comply with specific accounting standards if compliance with the standard would be so misleading that they do not provide information to users and financial statements would no longer be fairly presented. What particular framework allows management to deviate from what the standards are asking? This is, of course, our fair presentation framework. Okay, another application. When an entity departs from the requirements of an IFRS, or in our case, PFRS, it must disclose, number one, that management has concluded that the financial statements present fairly, the entity's financial position, financial performance, and cash flows. If you recall what we said a while back, then statement one is true. Management has to explicitly state that. Number two, that it has complied with the applicable standards and interpretations except that it has departed from a particular requirement to achieve a fair presentation, this is also true, right? Where management has to explicitly state that while this is the standard that we have deviated from, we have complied with the rest of the standards. Number three, the title of the standard or interpretation from which the entity has departed, the nature of the departure, including the treatment that the IFRS would require, the reason why that treatment would be misleading, and the treatment adopted by management. Yes, this is the part where management identifies what particular standard was deviated from, justifies why the deviation is necessary, and would explicitly state as well what treatment was adopted in lieu of that particular standard. And number four, for each period presented, the financial effect of the departure on each item in the financial statements that would have been reported in complying with the requirement. And this is also true. These are actually the four things that management must explicitly acknowledge in the rare instance that management departs from a requirement of a standard or of a framework. Now, we must remember from the viewpoint of the auditor, when the compliance framework is being overridden by the fair presentation framework, here go, when management follows the fair presentation framework, providing either more or less than what the standards require, management must justify. From our end as auditors, we should confirm the justification to be true. Otherwise, if we have reason to believe that the just sorry I'm sorry that the justification is not true, then the audit report must be modified. Sorry, bulul mode. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the overall objectives. We said it's twofold, right? Number one, the opinion. Number two, the report. When we talk about the opinion, we actually have two types of opinions. The first, which is the most popular one is called the unmodified opinion. This is also called the unqualified opinion. The unmodified or the unqualified opinion is what we call in our jargon as the clean opinion. We give this opinion when the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework. This is, of course, the opinion that our clients would receive. Now, the other category of opinions is what we call the modified opinion. An auditor modifies their opinion based on two reasons. So there are two sources, two reasons why auditors modify their opinion. The first one is when there is a misstatement or a violation of the standards. Take note that in this case, the violation must be unjustified, right? So not covered within the ambit of uh, the fair presentation framework. So where there's a misstatement or a violation, the auditor may modify their opinion. Another reason for the opinion modification is in the case of scope limitation. When the procedures that are deemed necessary to perform or satisfactorily perform an audit 
have been limited, then that can also be a basis for a modification of an opinion. Now, at this point, let us also appreciate the fact that whenever we talk about scope limitation, it could actually be scope limitation which are imposed by the circumstances, meaning to say beyond the control of management. But then it is also possible for management to actively limit the scope of the audit. And this is what we call management imposed scope limitation we point that out as early as now because later that will have an impact on the type of opinion that we may give let's go back to the modified opinions we're saying the reason for the modification may either be a misstatement or a scope limitation once you are able or once the auditor is able to identify the reason the auditor then proceeds to identifying the effect of either this misstatement or this scope limitation and the auditor may see that the effect is material but not pervasive so if the effect is isolated if the effect can be contained in an account but is still considered material then the auditor may give a qualified opinion in the case of a misstatement or a violation a qualified opinion is basically us saying that the financial statements are fairly presented except for so there is an exception but the exception is not pervasive enough to overshadow the entire financial statements it's kind of like saying if the unmodified opinion is when we tell people maganda ka you are pretty when we talk about a qualified opinion we're saying you know what you look good except that you lack the height so the lack of height doesn't make the person any less pretty right except for so that's a modified opinion qualified opinion the financial statements are fairly presented except for but do you know that an auditor may also give a qualified opinion in the case of a scope limitation whose effect is material but also not pervasive? So we get to see here that a qualified opinion may be given regardless of the reason. The qualified opinion does not care so much about the reason. The qualified opinion only cares about the fact that the effect is not pervasive. Now, what will happen if, upon assessment of the effect, the auditor finds out that the effect is both material and pervasive? Meaning to say, the effect can no longer be isolated to one particular account. In the words of the Bisaya, nagtakod-takod na ang effect niya. No? So, in the case of material and pervasive effects, the auditor will really have to look at the reason to decide what which opinion to give. Because if it's because of a misstatement or violation and the effect is both material and pervasive, the auditor can only give an adverse opinion. An adverse opinion is when we say the financial statements are not fairly presented. However, if the reason is by virtue of a scope limitation, the auditor will give a disclaimer of opinion. A disclaimer of an opinion is kind of like the auditor's version of a no comment. The auditor gives a no comment or disclaims, disclaims an opinion because if the scope limitation results to a material and pervasive effect, that means technically the auditor was not able to perform an audit. The auditor was not able to carry out a satisfactory audit. And because the auditor was not able to audit, then the auditor cannot give an opinion. Ergo, disclaim the opinion. Now, a while back, we mentioned that there are two sources or two reasons for a scope limitation right one is imposed by circumstances the other is imposed by management now there is a special consideration to be made by the auditor if the scope limitation is imposed by management because if such is the case that means management is not making true their responsibility with regards to premises of the audit one of the important premises of the audit is that management will provide the auditor unrestricted access to people and records necessary necessary to satisfactorily complete the audit. So if management is actively restricting the scope of the audit, meaning to say if the reason of the scope limitation that has both a material and pervasive effect is management imposed, then the auditor must first endeavor to withdraw from the engagement. And should the auditor not be allowed to withdraw from the engagement, then that's the time the auditor gives a disclaimer of opinion. Right? So that is in terms of the audit opinion. However, this time, let's take a look at the audit report. 
which is the second of the two-fold overall objectives, right? Now, the audit report may also be unmodified. The unmodified audit report is what we usually call the standard unmodified report covered by our PSA or ISA 700. But then there is also what we call modified reports, right? So unmodified reports are associated with unmodified opinions, but it is possible for a report to be modified by virtue of a modified opinion. Meaning to say, when we give qualified, adverse, and disclaimer, then automatically the report also gets modified. But do you know that it is possible to give an unmodified opinion but a modified report? Such as the case of additional paragraphs, our emphasis of matter paragraph and our other matter paragraph. These paragraphs do not have the power to change the opinion. However, it has the power to modify the report. It modifies the report in the sense that, well, there are additional paragraphs embedded into the report, but it has no power to change the opinion. Ergo, when we talk about modifications, we talk about either modifications to the opinion or modifications to the report, which may not necessarily modify the opinion. But we will talk more of that later. The gist being that when a report is modified, it could be a result of either a modified opinion or an unmodified opinion, but there are additional paragraphs being placed into the report. Here go, making the report modified. Now, speaking of the standard auditor's report, so let us now present what is the auditor's standard report. And for this, we will take a look at or we will use as our main point of reference PSA 700. So essentially, these are the elements of a standard unmodified opinion. And we will be looking at each of these elements in more detail in the subsequent slides. Starting, of course, with the very first element, and that is the title. The title should clearly indicate that it is the report of an independent auditor in order to, number one, emphasize the independence of the auditor. Because if you must remember, an audit requires independence both in fact and in appearance from the auditor. So we need to emphasize that independence and also to distinguish from reports that might be issued by others such as reports issued by management, internal auditors, or other analysts. So therefore, our audit report needs to have a title that clearly indicates that is the work of an independent auditor. Next to the title, we will find the addressee. And the addressee would, of course, be, or it, the report will, of course, be addressed to those parties for whom the report is prepared. Ordinarily, this will be to the shareholders, the board of directors, or the third party requesting the audit. Now, in certain instances, the audit report may be addressed to, let's say, for example, an officer of the entity, but we have to remember that it should not be addressed only to that officer. So say, for example, if the auditor would address the audit report to the president, it would, normally be, it would normally be to the president and the board of directors or to the president and shareholders. So it should not be to an officer only. Otherwise, it might deviate from what we have previously discussed on the elements of an assurance engagement in which it has to be clear that there are three parties to the said engagement. The first major section following the addressee will be the auditor's opinion. And this shall have the heading, Opinion. So if you can imagine, right at the very start, the reader of the audit report will already see what is the opinion of the auditor. This section actually includes two paragraphs. The first paragraph is what we traditionally knew of as the introductory paragraph. So the first paragraph serves to identify the entity whose financial statements have been audited. It serves to state that the financial statements have been audited. That's why if you're familiar with the terminologies or the wordings of the audit report, it would normally open by saying, we have audited the financial statements of XYZ company. Right? So it states that the FS have been audited it identifies the entity whose FS have been audited. It identifies the title of each statement comprising the financial statements. It makes a reference to the notes, including a summary of significant accounting policies, and of course specifies the date of or the period covered by each financial statement. 
So that's the introductory paragraph. Following the introductory paragraph will already be the auditor's opinion. So let's take a look at how that will look like. So we start with the title. And if you notice, the title clearly indicates that it is the work of an independent auditor, followed by the addressee. In this case, the board of directors and stockholders of ABC Company. After the address C, we will have the section on opinion. Now, notice we have placed a subheading there, report on the audit of financial statements. I'd like for you to pay particular attention to that because in certain instances, it is possible for this subheading to not appear. Okay, so but for now, it's there. I'll explain later what it is doing there. But not all audit reports have this subheading, right? But let's just put it there for now. We will have the first section, and because we are illustrating the standard auditor's opinion or the standard auditor's report, then the assumption is that we are giving an unmodified or unqualified opinion. Ergo, our heading will simply be opinion. And like what we said, the opinion section is actually made up of two paragraphs. The first paragraph being the introductory paragraph. It states that it has been audited. It mentions the name of the entity. It identifies the financial statements. It identifies or makes a reference to the notes. And then, of course, states the period covered by these financial statements. And the second section or the second paragraph already contains the opinion of the auditor, which in this case would read, in our opinion, the companion financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the company as at December 31 and its financial performance and consolidated cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with the Philippine financial reporting standards. So this is how the first few elements would look like the title, the address C, and then the opinion. So let's proceed. What's going to follow the opinion? What will follow the opinion will, of course, be the basis for opinion. Now, fun fact, in the previous versions of PSA 700, in the superseded versions of PSA 700, the basis for opinion used to be included in the report only if the report is modified. But now, with our PSA 700, this section will appear regardless of the opinion. This is now a required section regardless of the opinion. And this shall have the heading basis for opinion. Now, this section is where we will introduce to the readers our initial introduction to the readers of the Philippine Standards on Auditing. So, where previously we state that we have audited the financial statements and that we gave our opinion on the FS in accordance with PFRS, this time we are going to specifically mention that our audit was conducted in accordance with PSAs. Then we refer to the section of the auditor's report that describes our responsibilities in detail because there will be a separate section where we talk about the auditor's responsibilities. After that, it will include a statement that the auditor is independent of the entity in accordance with the relevant ethical standards and will close off with a statement that the auditor believes that the audit evidence that has been obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for the opinion. Again, our assumption here is that we are issuing a standard unmodified report that of course contains an unmodified opinion. And this is how the basis for the opinion section would look like. So we have a heading that says basis for opinion and we state that our audit is conducted in accordance with PSAs. We make a reference to the separate section of the auditor's report where we outline our responsibilities for the audit. We state that we are independent in accordance with the requirements for fundamental ethical requirements and we make a statement that says we believe that the audit evidence we have gathered is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our opinion. So this is the section on the basis for opinion. Following that is a special paragraph that we call MURGC or material uncertainty related to going concern. Another fun fact, the MURGC used to be, in the old standards, it used to be just one of the many emphasis of matter paragraphs. So if you're going to trace the history of MURGC, it actually comes from the pool of emphasis of matter paragraphs. But right now, in our new standards, it has really been given prominence in that it has its own paragraph and we call it material uncertainty related to going concern. Now, this section will not be present all the time. 
it will only be seen in the auditor's report if, number one, the use of the going concern assumption is appropriate, and number two, there is material uncertainty relating to going concern, and this material uncertainty has been adequately disclosed. All right, so I repeat the two conditions. Number one, if the use of the going concern assumption is appropriate, and number two, when there is a material uncertainty that the client has adequately disclosed. Then and only then will we see this paragraph in the auditor's report. But we will be having a separate discussion on going concern uncertainties when we reach the portion on completing the audit. All right, so now let's take a look at key audit matters. The key audit matters section is a relatively new section covered by PSA 700. One, and this is applicable to audits of complete sets of general purpose financial statements of listed entities. We take note that this will be for listed entities, not necessarily public entities because there may be public entities which are no longer listed, but this one is specifically for listed entities. So where do we draw out the CAMs? Now, the key audit matters or the CAMs are actually sourced from the matters communicated to those charged with governance. So from those matters communicated to TCWG as outlined in ISA or PSA 260, the auditor will then filter it to matters that require significant attention and from the matters that require significant attention the auditor will further filter it to matters of utmost significance it is the matter it is those matters of utmost significance that are considered as camps or key audit matters in the audit report so let's go back to where all of these is sourced from. We said it is sourced from matters communicated to TCWG. So what are the matters we communicate to TCWG? According to PSA 260, we communicate to TCWG the auditor's responsibilities, the plan scope and timing of the audit, the auditor's independence, which, by the way, in the case of listed entities, must be communicated in writing, and significant findings. Our key audit matters will be sourced from the significant findings. So what are these significant findings? Well, we talk about significant qualitative aspects of the entity's accounting practices, significant difficulties encountered by the auditor in the conduct of the audit, significant matters discussed with management, material weaknesses in internal controls, requests for written representations, as well as other matters. Now, you might know Notice some of these matters have an asterisk at the end of their statement. This just means to say that we communicate this to TCWG unless all members of management or all members of TCWG are also members of management. Because if all members of TCWG are also members of management, then we have already discussed with them these items. Significant matters discussed with management, material weaknesses, and requests for written representation. So from this pool of significant items, the auditor filters it to those matters that required significant auditor attention. And from there, matters of utmost significance, which will eventually make up our key audit matters. Now, here are the considerations of the auditor in determining key audit matters. Number one, areas considered to be susceptible to higher risks of material misstatement or, if you recall, that which we call significant risks. Second, significant auditor judgments in relation to financial statements that involve significant management judgment. And thirdly, the effect on the audit of significant events or transactions that have taken place during the audit. So I guess at this point, you must have noticed that the operative term here is significant, right? Now, let's take a look at how CAM interacts with other sections of the audit report as well. Say, for example, the auditor gives a modified opinion now either qualified adverse or disclaimer in the case of a modified opinion we know that the reason for the modification must have been so significant right in fact i would say it has even breached the utmost significance level and because it is so significant as to warrant a change in the opinion then the reason for the modification is no longer worthy to be placed under cam because it will now have its own separate 
thrown, if you will, under the basis for opinion section. So whatever is the reason for the modification to the opinion, it should not be lodged together with CAM or the other CAMs. Rather, it shall be given prominence in the basis for opinion section. Unless, unless the auditor gives a disclaimer of opinion, in a case of a disclaimer of opinion, there will be no other CAMs, all right? So, Matters that cause a modification to the opinion, either qualified or adverse, are CAMs in themselves. We only recognize qualified or adverse because, as we mentioned, if the opinion is disclaimer, there will be no CAM at all anyway, right? However, they are given prominence by placing them in the basis for qualified or adverse opinion paragraph. They should not be lodged in the CAM section. Now, what about if the auditor gives an adverse opinion? Is it possible? possible for the audit report to still contain CAMs? Well, ideally, because when we talk about adverse opinion, this means that the entire financial statements are not fairly presented. Thereby, ideally, if the opinion is adverse, we don't really expect there to be any other CAMs, right? But in case there are, because it is possible for the auditor to give an adverse and still have other CAMs, in case there are, then we just have to make sure that the presence of the other CAMs do not overshadow the fact that the opinion is adverse. So when given an adverse opinion, it is possible to, for there to be no other CAMs. However, if there are other CAMs, it should not imply that the FS is more credible in view of the adverse opinion. Like what we have said, it should not overshadow the adverse opinion. Now, what about in case of comparative financial statements where two or more periods are presented? Should the auditor should the auditor in the audit report also include key audit matters of the prior periods presented? The answer is no. Key audit matter determination is limited only to the current period, even when comparative financial statements are presented. And lastly, in the case of key audit matters and emphasis of matter paragraphs or the additional paragraphs, we have to recognize that key audit matters are key audit matters. If it's a CAM, it should not be the subject of an EOM or of another matter paragraph. If CAM, then it should remain within CAM. If you wish to draw prominence to a particular key audit matter, then the auditor may do so within the CAM section, such as, for example, in, arrange, in arranging the items under the CAM section and placing the one which the auditor wishes to emphasize most as the first in the list to give it prominence. But a matter under CAM should not be the subject of an emphasis of matter paragraph. Okay, A CAM should not be the subject of an EOM. If you wish to draw prominence in a CAM, do it within the CAM section, but do not make it the subject of an additional explanatory paragraph. All right, so this is how the CAM section would look like. We start by an introduction of what are key audit matters. Okay, so key audit matters are those matters that in our professional judgment were of most significance in our audit. These matters were addressed in the context of our audit of the financial statements as a whole and informing our opinion thereon and we do not provide a separate opinion on these matters. And then the auditor will proceed to describing each key audit matter in accordance with PSA 701. One. So you would notice that while our standards are actually encouraging uniformity in wording to ensure that wherever you are in the globe, you will be able to recognize a correctly written audit report, but this section of the report cannot be captured in a template because there will be different CAMs across different clients and there will be different descriptions of the different CAMs across different clients. So in this case, the auditor must outline and describe each of the the key audit matter, including how these were addressed in the audit. Let's try to apply or let's try to answer some questions relating to key audit matters. Again, we identify whether these statements are true or false. Statement one, key audit matters may take the place of note disclosures in the financial statements. In other words, may key audit matters replace the note disclosures? The answer, of course, is no. So therefore, it makes statement one false. The key audit matter will be part of our audit report. The note disclosures are part of the financial statements and CAMs should not take 
take the place of note disclosures. Statement two, the description of the key audit matters is a reiteration of what is disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. And this is again false. We don't simply copy or reiterate what is found in the notes because we also include how this has been addressed in our audit. Statement 3. When the audit opinion given is an adverse opinion, there shall be no other key audit matter presented in the report. And in this case, the answer also is false. It is possible, while ideally there should be no other, but it is still possible for other CAMs to be present. We just have to make sure that these other CAMs do not overshadow the fact that our opinion is adverse. Statement 4. An auditor is not required to update key audit matters included in the prior period's auditor's report. And if you remembered, we said the determination of CAM is for the current year period, even if prior periods have been presented. So statement 4 is actually true. The auditor is not required to update the CAMs found in the prior period auditor's report. And statement 5, when comparative financial information is presented, the introductory language of the CAM section is tailored to draw attention to the fact that the key audit matters described relate to only the audit of the financial statements of the current year. And this is, of course, also true. Let's proceed to another set of statements. Statement 1, key audit matters are mandatory to be communicated in the auditor's reports for audits of financial statements of listed entities. And statement 1 is true. Statement 2, key audit matters may also be decided by the auditor to be communicated for non-listed entities. And this is one thing that we also have to recognize with regards CAMs. While CAMs, at the very minimum, are required for listed entities, the audit firms themselves may actually voluntarily, voluntarily submit their clients to the presentation of CAMs, the audit firms may have their own criteria as to which other engagements may need to have CAMs in their reports, whether these are audit or not audit engagements, whether these are listed or not listed clients, the audit firms may voluntarily submit these clients to CAM determination. So statement two is true. Statement 3. Key audit matters are mandatory to be communicated in the auditor's reports for audits of financial statements of public entities. Public entities, and this is false because CAMs are required for listed entities. Again, it is possible for public companies to have been subsequently delisted. Okay, so this is only for listed entities. And as a fun fact, public companies are defined in the Securities Regulation Code of the Philippines, SRC 68, as amended as entities with assets of at least 50 million and have 200 or more holders, each holding at least 100 shares of a class of its equity securities. But again, for CAMs, what we are looking for are for listed entities. Statement 4, when an auditor is required to communicate CAM in respect of an audit of consolidated financial statements, the auditor is also required to communicate CAM in respect of the audit of separate financial statements, and this is false. Okay, so this will be done on the consolidated financial statements where we issue our report on. So that's it for CAMs. <laughs> After the key audit matters section, we now proceed to the responsibilities for the FS. And this shall have the heading, Responsibilities of Management and Those Charged with Governance for the Financial Statements, reflecting the fact that it is not just management, but including TC. WG. So this section shall describe management's responsibility for preparing the FS and the design and implementation of internal controls, together as well with the assessment of going concern, and of course, a statement about the responsibility of those charged with governance regards the oversight function of the business. And this is how it will look like. So that's the heading. And this one right here will outline the responsibilities of management for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements, including internal controls, the design and implementation of internal controls. Here we also see that we are outlining management's responsibility as well for assessing the company's ability to continue as a going concern. And then the statement about TCWG and how they are responsible for overseeing the company's financial reporting process.
Right? So that's it for responsibilities of management and TCWG. Following management's responsibilities will, of course, be the auditor's responsibilities for the audit of financial statements. So actually, to be quite honest, this is the lengthiest part of the report. And the heading shall be auditor's responsibilities for the audit of financial statements. It is so lengthy because it would seem like we're going to give a mini lecture about the entire audit process here in an attempt to make the readers understand just precisely what the jurisdiction of our evaluation or examination is. This section will make a reference to the objectives of the auditor, which we have reviewed earlier on in this video, the concept of reasonable assurance. We state that misstatements may either come from fraud or error. We also tell the readers about professional judgment and professional skepticism, including materiality. We give a brief description of the audit, and we tell them what matters are required to be communicated with those charged with governance. Like I said, friends, this is kind of like a mini lecture of the entire audit process. So that's why this section is so lengthy. It is so lengthy that our standards are giving us options as to how it may be presented. So this section may be located either within the body of the auditor's report, as part of the auditor's report, or it may be presented as an appendix to the auditor's report. In the case the auditor wishes to include it as an appendix to the report, then the report shall include a reference to the location of the appendix. A third option is for the auditor to make a specific reference to the location of such a description on either a website or an appropriate authority. Okay, but law or regulation or national auditing standards must permit the auditor to do so. So while this is an available option currently in the Philippines, this has not yet as of time of recording. This is not a popular option as we haven't had any law or regulation yet that permits the reference to a particular website. We do not have an authorized website yet to contain the auditor's responsibilities. So currently, it's only either within the body of the auditor's report or as an appendix, but the standards do allow a third option, and that is to refer to an authorized website. So this is how it's going to look like. So brace yourselves because like I said, it's going to be quite lengthy. It's like a summary of our auditing theory discussion. So audit responsibilities for the audit of the financial statements. We mention our objectives. We mention that misstatements can arise from either fraud or error. We also make mention that as part of our audit, we exercise professional judgment and professional skepticism. And then we give a description of the audit process, the risk assessment phase, obtaining an understanding of internal control, <laughs> evaluation of the appropriateness of accounting policies used by management. And while previously management has acknowledged that where we have outlined that management is the one responsible for assessing whether the company will still continue as a going concern, here we state that we conclude on whether management's use of the going concern assumption is appropriate or not. And then... We tell them that we evaluate the overall presentation, structure, and content of the financial statements, including the disclosures, and we cap off with the communication with those charged with governance. Pretty lengthy. This is like one of the lengthiest sections of the audit report. Okay, and from there, we also tell them, in the case of listed entities, how CAMs are determined and how CAMs are basically sourced from the matters that we have communicated to those charged with governance. All right. Now, do you remember a while back I told you to take note of that subheading that appeared before the opinion paragraph, the report on the audit of financial statements? That's what the subheading looked like. Now, I mentioned that because that subheading will only come out. It will only come out. It will only be present if the auditor has other reporting responsibilities. In other words, if the auditor doesn't have other reporting responsibilities, we will not be seeing that heading. 
But in the case of il our illustration, we saw that heading, so it is then safe to expect that the auditor has other reporting responsibilities. So the auditor may have additional responsibilities to report on other matters that are supplementary to the auditor's responsibility under our Philippine Centers in Auditing to report on the financial statements. If such is the case, then we use the heading or the subtitle report on the financial statements or report on the audit of financial statements on the first part before we give the opinion paragraph. In this particular section, we will use the heading report on other legal and regulatory requirements. So, for example, in the Philippines, auditors are required to report on BIR Revenue Regulation number 15-2010 and this is how it will look like. So, report on Okay, so we said report on other legal and regulatory requirements. So in this case, report on the supplementary information required under Revenue Regulation 15-2010 of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. So we mentioned that our audit was conducted for the purpose of forming an opinion on the basic FS as a whole. This supplementary information is presented for purposes of filing with the BIR. Such information is the responsibility of the management of our client and the information has been subjected to auditing procedures applied on our audit and in our opinion is fairly stated in all material respects. Such is the case. This will, uh, the, the section will look like this. Because in the case of BIR Revenue Relations 15-2010, this supplementary information is considered integral to the financial statements. And by virtue of it being integral to the financial statements, then the auditor also includes it in their opinion. And after this section, the auditor will then sign the report, date the report, and of course provide the auditor's address. The name of the engagement partner has to be indicated in the audit report, but with a harm's way exception. What do we mean by a harm's way exception? This simply means that if including or indicating the personal name of the partner will cause undue harm to the partner, then because of the harm's way exception, uh, it may be allowed that the name will not be mentioned. So in this case, that is what we mean by harm's way exception. Okay, so the name of the engagement partner has to be indicated unless it poses undue personal harm to the partner. Now, let us be reminded that in the Philippines, BIR and SEC are requiring the audit reports to be manually signed. So e-signatures are not acceptable. Right. So then the auditor's address will simply indicate the jurisdiction of the practice of the auditor. This is not going to be your personal home address. So you don't have to worry about clients, you know, like knocking on your door. So this will just be the jurisdiction of your practice. The very important to the audit report is actually the date of the report. And we are reminded that the report should be dated as of the completion of all essential audit procedures. In other words, this will be upon completion of the audit. Needless to say, our audit procedures and the evidence that we gather as a result of those procedures are the basis for our opinion. And so therefore, we cannot complete the audit if we haven't yet gathered sufficient and appropriate evidence. Right? So we cannot date the report unless we have completed all essential audit procedures. The date of the report is important as it informs the readers that the auditor has considered the financial statement effects of subsequent events that occurred up to this date. In other words, the date of the audit report fixes your responsibility to obtaining sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So up to the date of the audit report, the readers can expect that you have gathered sufficient and appropriate evidence even for events which occurred after balance sheet date. So for those events that occurred after balance sheet date up to the date of the audit report, then the auditor still has an active responsibility to gather sufficient and appropriate evidence for that. So that's the importance of the date of the audit report. It fixes your responsibility. Now, we are also reminded that the auditor should not date the report earlier than the date on which the financial statements are signed or approved by management. We remember that management is the one responsible for the financial statements. And so by virtue of that, they should be approving the financial statements first before we date our audit report. In practice, however, it is very common to see the date of the audit report to be the same date as the approval of management of the financial statements and that's perfectly fine for as long as the auditor does not date it earlier than management 
So the rule of thumb is management first, auditor next in the case of dating the report. So those, my friends, are the essential elements of the standard unmodified report. We are yet to talk about the other sections, but as it is, this video is already quite lengthy. So up next, we're going to talk about EOM and OM, but for now, we're going to close off this section of the video, and I hope to see all of you in the next one.